Good afternoon, friends. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, and uh, today's message is going to be uh, speaking about the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 2. And uh, this is also a difficult message for me to deal with because uh, it is in light of the fact of uh, a video that, uh, that had been made by uh, Paul Begley, uh, a man that has been a friend of ours for years. And um, uh, so I'm very concerned about uh, this particular video that, that he had released himself. Uh, I actually seen this on Yehuda Glick's uh, YouTube channel, End Time Prophecy on the Vision for Jerusalem. And uh, of course, I met Yehuda Glick through Paul Bagley uh, several years back. We also interviewed uh, Yehuda Glick uh, only a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, I guess now, when we were over in Israel, myself and my wife, Yana. Uh, and, and Yehuda Glick is a very likable, likable person as, as well. And, uh, but nonetheless, prophecies are... Um, being revisited uh, through the eyes of many, uh, many ministers and stuff and, and more along the uh, Zionist viewpoint. That is the recreation of the state of Israel, the building of the third temple, and they're being interpreted that way uh, based on that. And like Paul, I used to be in that same boat. I was very much Zionist, even though I was not Zionist as far as um, in, in the respect of a, a Jewish state running the entire globe or a new world order, uh, by no means, I did not believe in that, but I, I looked at the prophecies and many of them I put in the future as well. Uh, I was, of course, looking at the, you know, the Jewish people, that their eyes would come open and that they would recognize Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And so I know Paul is really no different than I am when it comes to that. The only difference is, is because of his friendships and relationships there, uh, it, it even blinds you further uh, to knowing what the truth is. And, and I fully intend to talk to, to uh, Paul very soon. Again, I'm going to reach out to him once more. Uh, I really feel that I owe that to him because we have been friends for a long time. And uh, I know there's many of you that would, you know, you don't like Paul, you speak badly of him, but I, I really, I must tell you one thing as well. And this is something that my wife needs to speak about more so because God gave her a very powerful dream the other morning she woke up from, uh, nearly traumatized from, I should say, but the Holy Spirit revealing to her those things that are coming. And one of the things, and this is one thing that really helped me to realize this was truly of God, was that she said to me that all these petty divisions that people have have got to stop. We've got to come together as believers and really unite in this time because the believers are going to be hunted down. And, uh, and she also... One of the things that came out of her mouth was uh, Paul Begley. She said, the Lord said to me, when I saw this in the dream and everything, she said, the Lord said to me, you must tell Paul, stop preaching the things that he's preaching because they're not true. That he must return to the Word of God, to the, to the very foundations of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And so... I want to speak to you, especially those of you that, that know Paul, that love him. And, uh, you know, if you really love him, try to speak to him, as I will do myself. And this man, has, he's tried his life to win souls to Christ, but I see him in the balance right now. <clears throat> And again, I have to say to you, I was where Paul was as well. Very much looking at Israel as a timepiece, expecting these prophecies to be fulfilled, futurizing many of the biblical prophecies that I have later begun to discover have been fulfilled already. What we're going to talk about, though, like I said, is it's, a, it's, a, it's one of Paul's television broadcasts. So this was on national television, not to mention... 
has been on multiple channels uh, going all over the world. <clears throat> And I'm going to start uh, on, on this, and this is on Uticlick's side, but I think it's pretty much the same that Paul would have on his, so maybe the minute marks should be about the same. Uh, but I want to start here at the 18 minute mark, then we're going to back up to about 13 minutes, 45 seconds in the video here. And I want to play for you, though, what he says about Isaiah chapter 2. And then we're going to examine these things by the scripture. And, uh, and remember, <clears throat> like I said, I, I know Yehuda Glick as well, not, not nowhere near as well as Paul does, but I would say to, to, to Brother Paul, listen, if you really love Yehuda Glick, you need to do all you can to point him to Jesus Christ. And there's two things that are very critical in this video that I need to point out. And this has to be done as well because the body of Christ is hearing these things and they're putting this in the future as well. So this is why the correction must be done because it is a public issue. So let's take a look at the video here now on Yehuda Glick's website and we're at 18 minutes, 15 seconds. Listen to uh, what Paul says here. And I think many of us have to ask. Let's make sure we have the volume cranked up so that everything picks up very nicely. <clears throat> and I have a very bad internet where I am here, so please bear with me on some of these things. It's a little slow and going. Let's listen here now. And let me back back up just a little bit. <clears throat> in, in this end time, and I think oh, many of us have to ask God, what is my, what do you want me to do, God, during this time of these end times, these last days? Well, you know, he mentions Isaiah chapter 2. And, and Don't you Isaiah it one, but let's talk about Isaiah 2 for a moment, because this is what the scripture says. The prophet Isaiah said these words in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, Notice here the power of the scripture. It says it plainly. Isaiah says this is going to happen in the last days that the house of the Lord will be established on the top of the mountain. Obviously it's going to be built again on the temple mounts right where it was the first time with King Solomon. Get this, but notice what Rabbi Yehuda Glick said in the first chapter of Isaiah. He said, but God spoke to him and said, but don't you worry about that right now until you first do Isaiah 1. Well, what does it say in Isaiah 1? Well, who did he say he married? He just married a lady who was also a widow. And Yehuda Glick's wife had died, so he was a widow. And they met. She ran an organization to take care of the widows and the orphans. So look what the Bible says in Isaiah 1. Uh, it says these words in verse 16. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings, from before my eyes cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. But notice what God was requiring he was requiring that the widows and the orphans be looked after so that this becomes the, uh, really the perfect will of God, okay? The really the perfect will of God is undefiled before God. Pure religion is to uh, take care of the widows and their affliction and take care of the fatherless. So Isaiah, uh, what happened here is Isaiah's prophecy spoke to the heart, I think, of Rabbi Yehuda Glick. To make sure he looks after the widows and the orphans in Jerusalem as the temple is about to be built. 
Now, and this is where the video ended at, all right? Now, I, I really, in all fairness, we've heard that entire clip there. I need to take you back. I want to hear. I want you to hear where Yehuda Glick speaks about this as well. And, and, and understand, I care about these men. You know, I do care very deeply. And I'm not blind to the fact either that there are those in Israel that are not Jews. There is a Nephilim race there as well. But we're, and that, you're going to find out something shocking about Isaiah 2 in just a moment as well. But listen to Yehuda Glick speaking about the same thing, and then I'm going to show you how I would have addressed it myself. Unbelievable. I never understood it. I'm reading the Bible. We, we spoke about Isaiah 2, right? Right. But we forget about Isaiah 1. Okay. In Isaiah 1, what does Isaiah say? Guys, don't forget the orphans and the widows. Yes, he does say that. One second. Zechariah. In Zechariah 7, there's a delegation. Guys, going to, going to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 7. Starting to build the temple. Should we stop fasting and mourning for the temple? So what does Zechariah say to them? Guys, before we talk about the temple, we got one more thing to talk about. Don't forget the orphan and the widow. Wow. And suddenly I said to myself, look. God teaching me, saying to me, Yehuda, you're dealing with Jerusalem. What about the orphan and the widow? Yeah. So here I have, together in my office, my wife running this organization called The Brave, which is empowering, empowering widows and orphans. They meet together, they talk together, they right. share, and, and they really get psychological leading and, 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 and uh, guidance. And encouragement. And encouragement, and encouragement. Building their faith. Building their self. These are people who, you know, you know, the connection between parent and, and, and child is a holy thing. Yes. And it's one of the Ten Commandments. And when the, that, that link okay. breaks... When... Now, you can listen to the video. I did myself. Uh, and you will discover, in which many of you probably already realize it, Paul read it for himself. He read it right there on his own page there when he quotes it there. Right? Verse 17, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Now, how many of you see that word, relieve the oppressed, and have already asked yourself the question, what about the oppressed? That's a good thing. I appreciate that Yehuda Glick is they're caring for the widow and they're caring for the orphans of Israel. But everybody seems to totally neglect, they negate the whole issue of the oppressed, which are your Palestinians. Okay? Look, Zechariah, he quoted as well, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, which is the orphan, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you devise evil against his brother in your heart. Again, the stranger, which is the foreigner, and Israel considers Palestinians foreigners. And then if we go and we examine Isaiah chapter 1, right? Learn to do well, seek justice, relieve the oppressed. You know, what's interesting, God says to them, learn to do well, because it doesn't come naturally, so they need to learn. Le madu, le mad, means to learn in Hebrew. Le madu is for all of them, learn, okay, to do well. Because they're not doing it naturally. And the first thing he tells them to do, relieve the oppressed. If you would relieve the oppressed, there wouldn't be any more problems. Then take care of the fatherless, take care of the widows. That's the same thing. What did Jesus say when he came in there and he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Of course, one of the Pharisees or Sadducees, I forget which one it was, he says, but who is my neighbor? Trying to justify himself. In other words, I've been taking care of my neighbor. But then Jesus says, there's a man that comes along, and of course he's attacked by the robbers, just paraphrasing the story. And first comes the Pharisee, looks at him, looks down, walks away, and has nothing to do with him, right? Another one comes by, has nothing to do with him. All of them are Jewish type people that this is going on to. But then the Samaritan comes along and sees the guy. 
And they already know, you already know the story from the little woman at the well when the Samaritan woman says to Jesus, we have no dealings with one another. There's a racial segregation here in the country. But the Samaritan takes the guy and cares for him, takes him in, bounds his wounds, all that, takes him in, tells the guy at the hotel, you care for him. If there's any cost whatsoever incurred, I'll pay for it when I get back. Now Jesus said, now who was the true neighbor out of all of those? So Jesus was showing them exactly what I'm telling you now. Don't oppress the stranger. Okay? And... Uh, which that's also where I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from Isaiah, but I'm not quoting it exactly right. But where it says here, um, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. And we know from Zechariah, you can't say that the fatherless and the widow are oppressed, and that's what it means there. No, because Zechariah goes into it clearly as well. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. So, Okay, you could say, yeah, the oppressed and the fatherless were, uh, were or the widow and the, and the fatherless were being oppressed, but when you deal with Zechariah combined together, he's also dealing with the stranger. So my first issue is, I commend Rabbi Yudiglik, uh, mainly his wife, that he's married now. She was a widow for 17 years, and I know that uh, according to Levitical law, a rabbi cannot marry unless it be a virgin or a, another widow's wife of a priest that would be. Uh, so it's kind of sad to see that she was left with four children and no one cared for her during that time of 17 years, if I understood right in the, in the story here. But, uh, but anyway, Yehuda Glick, they did marry. And, uh, and of course, he became a part of this, uh, helping the widows and the orphans. But again, go back and care for the stranger. Go back and care for those that are oppressed in the country, which are the strangers and the poor. And of course, that can also include uh, the, the, the Jewish people that are not even cared for in the nation. Such, uh, you know, they're, they're looked down upon. They're not Ashkenazi. They're Sephardim. Or they're, uh, maybe they're from Ethiopia etc. Those things as well. But now, let's get into, into Isaiah chapter 2. This is extremely important. And I've actually, I've got Isaiah 2 up in a couple of different ways. Uh, so I'll share this with you. Let me just see where we begin at here, right here. I've got this listed here on the screen for you so I could highlight things to point out things uh, as well. And this is, like I said, it's going to really, really You'll find this interesting, even in light of the Nephilim, when it comes to this here. The word of Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the top of the mountains. Okay? Now, this, there's a lot of things you have to understand. And the idioms and the expressions that are used in the Bible have to be understand even like it was 2,000 years ago. All right. The first thing I want to share with you, though, it shall come to pass, okay, vehaya beacharit hayamim. All right. Now, I don't have that highlighted there. Maybe I have it on the website here where I have it here. I do have it over here, so we'll look at it over here. The end of days. All right. That's an interesting expression there, right there. Vehaya Be'acharit, which is the next word right here, it comes from the word acher, which is in other days. All right. So literally, and it will it will come to pass, or it shall be, uh, in other days. Hayamim is of course the, the pluralizing for days. Nachon ichayacha bayet Yehova ba, excuse me, barosh hacharim, hacharim. Now. This is fascinating to me because one, what is called last days, uh, as it's translated very often throughout the Bible, is from the word achea. All right, and that is in other days. It doesn't necessarily, or it doesn't apply to the day we're living in. This was the last days was always known in the times of the of the people of of, of Israel back. 2,000 years ago plus, that that would be when the coming of the Messiah would be. All right? The coming of the Messiah, that when the Mashiach would come, that was the last days. Notice Job, and I didn't bring this one up. Let me, let me, let me, let me pull that up, and that, that might be the best one. 
Um, let's see, the skin worms, I think that'll help me pull it up the easiest. No, it doesn't bring it up. Let me, let me see. When Job talks about the skin worms, destroys this body. Yeah, here we go. Uh, Job 19 and 26. So I'm recording the screen so you're able to see this. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. All right, the latter day. Again, achoron is that word being used. Let me, let me pull that up for you so you can see it really well using memories, Hebrew, uh, mechon-memory.org. A lot of people ask me, where do you use on, online? I, I don't necessarily agree a lot of times with the English translation that they do here. Uh, it's very biased in many cases, uh, uh, Talmudically so. So I just warn you, in advance on that but in the book of Job again let's look at where this was Job 19 and verse 26 all right so we'll go over here to chapter 19 let's scroll down to verse 26 and here he says right here the ori okay and when after my skin this is destroyed then without my flesh shall I see God all right that's how they translate that right there now again they're translating it more Talmudically because they don't want you to know what uh, you know this is really speaking about the coming of the Messiah because afraid you might think that it was fulfilled already all right so here it is ve'ani yadati ali chai okay but as for me I know that my Redeemer liveth okay uh, like we say the word uh, uh, gula, you hear that a lot in Hebrew. That is, uh, re that is the word for redemption, okay, the gula. Okay, so guli, okay, ch uh, chaya, is uh, my redeemer lives, okay? So he says, ve'ani uh, adati guli chaya, I know, I know my redeemer liveth. All right, and here it is right here. This is where the word they're going to translate for the word ladder. All right, and here they put it over here at the last. Okay, there it is. Let me just highlight that separately. At the last, the Choron, and it doesn't want to highlight quite. There we go. The Choron, again, that's other days. Okay, doesn't necessarily mean the last day. Al, okay, uh, Al Afar Yakum. Okay, upon the dust, lift, and he will witness at the last upon the dust when after the skin worm has destroyed them, then without my flesh shall I see God. All right, now I think, I think actually uh, KGV probably actually translates this a little bit better. So for those of you that that's a little confusing, let me read it to you for, from here. That uh, uh, Job 19, for I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth and though after my skin worms destroy this body yet in my flesh shall I see God okay now he knew that Jesus Christ was already alive and he knew at the latter day that he would stand upon the earth and he would see that Redeemer and if you remember according to Matthew 28 the Bible said many of those which slept in the dust of the earth were resurrected and came in the city and mingled with the living all right so Job was one of those and he came up and he saw Christ all right so and we could also another one and I actually had this one pulled up because oddly enough if you look at your footnotes inside your Bible you they use uh, Genesis 49 uh, another scripture uh, let's see am I in Genesis 49 I think I am but am I at the place I wanted to be uh, okay it's a little further up I had it still had it marked all right, this is where Jacob tells his sons what's going to befall them in the latter days. And again, there it is again, you can see it right there. The root of that is Aleph Chet Reish Acher, okay, Acher, Be Acherit Chayamin, all right, in the end of days. But literally, it is in the other days. And that's just the way they translated it because it's, they're, they're, they're thinking that the end of days was the coming of the Messiah, all right? But watch what he says here. This is how you know when the fulfillment comes as well. He gets to Simon and Levi, our brethren. Weapons of violence, their kinship. Wow! 
Remember how many times I quote Daniel 11 when the angel says to Daniel, uh, oh, let's just, we got to go to it. I, 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 I got to say these things because, you know, I'm always concerned that somebody will be listening to this message. They will have never heard my older messages. And then they'll be like, oh, what does he mean? You know, well, 90% of the people all know, but that, that you got that few that don't. And so we just bear with us and let's look at these things. Those of you that have been here for a long time, I apologize that we need to do it this way. But for their sake, let's take that time. Go over to Daniel chapter 11. And I think it's at verse 14 uh, where he says this. Yes, it's already highlighted. I thank God that Google keeps this highlighted. Uva nepalati amcha. Also, the children of the violent among thy people shall lift themselves up to establish the vision, but they shall stumble. Now, the Talmud blames this on Jesus and his apostles and calls them zealots. What well, Jesus taught us, as the prophecy is being fulfilled, as we know, even in Isaiah 2, they shall learn war no more, because the Christian was taught not to use the sword. He that kills by the sword must die by the sword. So Jesus taught us not to war with one another, okay? I'm not talking about self-defense of your family, okay? So please understand that. But anyway, there it is. There's your violent, all right? And then what do we have over here? We're dealing with Genesis 49. Simon and Levi are brethren. Weapons of violent, violence, their kinship. Let my soul not come into their counsel and to their assembly. Let my glory not be united. Wow, Jacob did not want to be under the rule of Levi's children, for in their anger they slew men, and in their self-will they hoed, ox, uh, hoed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So see, he knew that the, the two houses would be split, that you'd have the house of Israel, the house of Judah, and that they would be scattered. And of course, the house of Israel was scattered in 70, 780 BC, and then, of course, Judah in 70 AD after the rejection of the Messiah. So, again, though, the whole purpose for this is to establish what that latter days are, and that was fulfilled in the latter days, and 70 AD basically was the conclusion of what we would call the latter days. So now that we have that established, we cannot put Isaiah chapter 2 as a future prophecy. All right, so let's take a look at this. And I have to go to the pictures because that's where I have most of this highlighted at. All right, so, and it shall come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow unto it. Now, we're going to get into the part about the mountain. And again, sometimes I feel like when I look at this in Hebrew, It's just the way they translate it is a little awkward sometimes. So let's take and let's just quickly, since we record the screen, you're able to see this a little bit better. Isaiah chapter 2. Let's take a look at this. And it shall come to pass in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow unto it. Right? And many... Uh, and many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and, out of, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, what I find really strange, when we look at this, this is often put in the future like Paul did on his broadcast. He puts this in the future. And he tells you they're going to build the third temple and it's going to sit right there. All right? Not realizing this scripture has been fulfilled. Right? And many people should go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to, to the house of God, of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. 
and he will and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Okay, now, let me show you something here. Really interesting. Because, let me go back. Isaiah, here we go, right here. This is something that is really overlooked by a lot. And nations shall flow unto it. That's how they translate that. Unto it. If the it was speaking of the temple, Isaiah would have never used it for the temple. And some may disagree with me on that, but I'm going to challenge you. Here is that word it right there on your screen for you. Eliav or Elav. Ve nachahu elav kol hagoim. And all the Gentiles will flow unto him. Now, you could translate that, that last vav right there. You could translate that. I'll highlight it in blue for you. You could translate that as it. But as I said, when they're speaking of the house of God, the Bayat Yehovah, I can't imagine them translating that to it. Because here's what's interesting. As I was showing you already, right, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the top of the mountains. Literally, the head of the mountains. Berosh. Acharim. Alright? King James shows you and it shall come to pass in the last days the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top but still surely the head, the head of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations shall flow, and they put it to it. But then they go on to say, and many people should go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. But now they're personalizing, they're putting that pronoun in there, he, his ways. But who's that referring to then? Who's the He? Who is the His? It's the Messiah. Alright? Now, as I said, there are idioms that are being used. When the prophets would write and speak of things, sometimes these things are allegoric. So, in this case here, the word mountain, let me go back to the Hebrew for you. Right? And... Let's take a serious look at this. Let us go up unto the mountain of God, El Har. Yehovah El Bayat Elohai Yaakov. The mountain of God. Let's go up to the mountain of God to the house of God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways. Now the antecedent of his ways is that mountain. Now, I want to share with you something. Um, and I don't know if I should go, yeah, I won't go to Isaiah and Septuagint as of yet, but let me just show something to you. I think you'll find this very interesting. There is, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, when we're dealing with um, when we were when we're dealing with and before I read all this to you let me I've got that is it right here I'm going to show to you where we're coming out of all right, make sure I have the right one that's the wrong book it's the other book go back to that one in a little bit 
a little cold out here where I'm at too right now because I'm outside. Um, this is from the part of this is from Melchizedek, but I'm actually going to be reading this one from 11Q Hymns. This is from the Hymns. All right. So you can see we're on page 1211. All right, you have the Hebrew on the other side of the page there as well. And that's, I'm sharing with you a clip of this, of the English side, so you can see this. Isaiah the prophet who said, and now they're quoting from Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace. The messenger of good who announces salvation, saying to Zion, your God reigns. Okay? Now, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger. Right? Now, here, here was, is interesting. They say, the, the interpretation, the mountains are the prophets. We've got a blank space, and it goes on, and the messenger is the anointed of the Spirit, as Daniel said about him in 925, an anointed prince, it is seven weeks, and the messenger, a good who announces salvation, is one about whom it is written. Now we know for a fact, even as Christians, that the messenger is the Messiah. All right? But what threw me for a loop is the fact that they interpret the mountains as the prophets. And it made sense because I had never thought about this before. I just happened to know that they had thought that. I didn't know if I agreed with them at the time as far as in the case of Isaiah 52. But when I begin to look at Isaiah and I'm dealing with chapter 2, I realize I already know the scripture is fulfilled. But I realized that in this case right here, the mountain must be referring to Jesus Christ. It shall come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the head of the mountains. All right? Now they put the top of the mountains. But if you look at the idiom of 2,000 years ago, or we could literally say 2,150 years ago thereabout, when the Dead Sea Scrolls are believed to have been pinned from this community there, and you consider the fact that it is obvious that Isaiah chapter 2 has been fulfilled, because we know this, and I'm going to get into that even deeper from the book of Hebrews, uh, you know, from the book of Luke, which is also cited in your footnotes, and that repentance or remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. We know from the book of Hebrews clearly that there was a new covenant, as it was prophesied in the Old Testament, a new covenant in all those scriptures. Jeremiah 31, uh, Isaiah's prophecies, Zechariah's prophecies, were all being fulfilled when Christ came. So how can we put Isaiah chapter 2 as a future fulfillment? Especially when we see clearly that in Isaiah, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the head of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it and all the Gentiles shall flow unto him. What it should read. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Why didn't they say to the temple of the Lord? Or the house of the Lord? And we are taught as Christians that Jesus Christ is the temple. A body has thou prepared me. God even said it in the Old Testament that he prepared a body. I mean, listen, and I think I've got this right here. My hands are very dry. I know some people say, well, Steve, why do you lick your fingers? My hands are dry and I can't really turn a page is why, right? Um, let's see. No, this is... And I always... I tell you, the sister that sent me so many of these that really helped me 
pull this collection together of this one right here. God bless you, my sister. You are such a blessing uh, for, for doing this, right? And he commands that a sanctuary of human be built for him so that they may offer incense in it to him. I'm, I'm like blown away. Now this is, this is writings that are part of the Qumran scrolls. You know, many of them biblical, some of them opinions, some of them write uh, psalms that we have, in fact this one here is Pashrim and commentaries, right? Um, but for them to realize that he commanded a sanctuary, Mikdash Yisrael, okay, that, that they would literally, and it says right there, Mikodesh Adom Lehayot, Lehayot, okay, that they would make a temple, in other words, a holy place that would be a human being. And this is why they called him the second Adam. Now I may be getting too deep as I go into this, trying to really help you to understand this, but it's because I, you have to understand, I'm also speaking to Paul in this as well and what he said there to really to help you to understand. It's not unto it, it's unto him. The Gentiles would flow unto him, but they're trying to fulfill a prophecy that's already been fulfilled. See, this is why Daniel says, also the children of the violent among thy people shall lift themselves up to establish the vision, but they shall stumble. What vision are they trying to establish? They're trying to establish the vision of Daniel, where in Daniel 9, where he talks about the coming of the Messiah. And of course, it's the violent among them. Well, <laughs> you know, we already talked about who those violent were. Clearly, the violent among them were none other than the, than the Levites. Because already, Simon, through the house of Israel, his children had already been dispersed to the rest of the world, but Levi had not. So Levi was the last ones, and they were called the violence, their kinship. In other words, that violence is going to be passed down. I mean, this is terrible, friends. Very terrible what we're seeing here, right? Now, this gets even deeper, though. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And when the people were coming up to the mountain, they were coming to Christ. And if you look at it as the prophets, he was the head. He was the greatest. He was the prophet. He was the Messiah. He was God manifested in a tent, not made with hands. He was the true tabernacle. And both, yes, the Jew and Gentile came. And on the day of Pentecost, we had both the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Everybody was present. And even the Gentiles that were converts that it came with the house of Israel on the day of Pentecost were all being converted. And then Paul takes the same gospel message to the Gentiles around the world. This was the latter days being fulfilled. Now, it gets very interesting. Let's continue on. All right. So out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Right? Okay. So, let's go deeper now. Verse 3 says, And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of God. We already got that part there, right? And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And this is where, <clears throat> when they put it in the footnote, footnotes, they cite Luke 24, 47 as that reference. <clears throat> and that is when Jesus himself states... Um, that that's been fulfilled. Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. It's done. Oh my gosh, friends. Okay? 
Now, let's, let's, let's move on down Isaiah just a little bit more. You will judge between the nations. You shall decide for many peoples. He. That's the Messiah. He shall judge between the nations. Bishaphat ben Hagalim. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither uh, shall they learn war anymore. Right? No, we keep, we keep translating all of this the way we do. But, oddly enough, he's talking about the Gentiles. See? The Goy. El Goy Charav. Velo Ilamado Od Melachama. See? The Gentiles will not learn war anymore. In other words, the, the, those that were believing the words of Jesus Christ would not want to go to war against the next nation any longer. Now, here's where it gets interesting, though. And I had to go a little further than what Paul did on this because I wanted you to see something that I caught as well. Go to verse 5, 6, 7, and 8. Look at this here. And O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Oh my, this is another one that you should know that it was Jesus Christ because why? Remember uh, the Gospel of John. Let me see if I even have it up here. All right, I don't have it up there, so let me just quickly let's post John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Okay, this is very, very important that we get to this. Okay, this is where we learn about the light. And who Christ really was, right? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Okay? All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was life. And the life was what? The light of men. And the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. Who's one that didn't compliment it? The Pharisees. Sadducees. Mostly you're dealing with your Pharisees and the sage, sages, you know, they're Talmudic writers of those times. And then we're trying to take and teach Christians to go underneath the rabbis. And Paul, you're, you're helping in the same way the Mark Bills, Yitzhak Shapira, Tovia Singer, of course Tovia Singer is Jewish anyway, but uh, uh, Jonathan Kahn, all these teachers are pushing to put the people underneath these rabbis and you're telling them that the law is going to come out of Israel. That's New World Order agenda. Paul, don't you understand, my brother? You're getting involved in something that if you don't repent and get away from it quickly, you may not find your way out. And I beseech you, my brother, to seriously look at this. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comforted it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men might believe. So when you're looking for another law to come out of Jerusalem with another Messiah, you're not looking at Jesus any longer. That's where we get into the prophecy of Habakkuk. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man and that cometh into the world. That's Jesus Christ, no other. Alright, so that's what that scripture is speaking of when we're looking at uh, when we're looking at Isaiah chapter 2 verse 5. Then we go to verse 6. For thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob. For they are replenished from the east and with soothsayers like the Philistines. And they please themselves in the brood of aliens. I, I, I mean, this is absolutely insane. And I never saw this before, but this is another scripture that identifies 
that Israel was guilty of the very sins that God said they were guilty of through the prophet, or excuse me, through the book of Ezra. All right, and we're going to have to pull that up. We're going to come to the Hebrew part of this in just a minute, where it says, Uveyeladai Necharim. That is the children of adultery. They replenish themselves in the brood of aliens as they translate it there. Now, I'm going to show you this real quick in the King James. Isaiah, we're into verse 5, excuse me, verse 6, I believe. Therefore, thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves and the children of strangers. That's what became your leaders. Maybe this is what the scripture says when it says children are your oppressors because you allowed the children of Nephilim to take control. Now, to prove my point here, let's take, we need to go and we need to look at the scripture that, that spoke of this. We're also, we have to, we have to, for the sake of the people, we've got to go to the book of Numbers as well. But let's look at this real quick. Um... Ezra, and in Ezra, I believe it's chapter 9, so, and everything is very slow, like I said, I'm dealing with a very difficult internet situation here, especially when you're dealing with multiple windows being open, right? Ezra 9, and this is where he says right here, I'll just read here the part in blue, starting with the part in blue, the people of Israel and the, oh, well, this is the beginning, now when these things were done, the princes drew near unto me, saying, the people of Israel and the priest... And the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Perzites, Jebusites, the Ammonites, Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken other daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the peoples of the lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been first in this faithfulness. Mingled their seed. Right? And of course, the Canaanite, they, this wasn't with the Babylonians, but notice it was from the east. Even Isaiah clearly identified right here, for they have replenished from the east. Okay? With what kind of people? With soothsayers like the Philistines. Well, that's where, that's where uh, the giant that David slew was a Philistine. Right? They pleased themselves in the brood of aliens. What made you happy because you had children by Nephilim? All right, and then, and then what else do we have? All right, let's, let's do it like again, just to prove the point, because some people will say, oh, the Nephilim, Steve, you don't know what you're talking about. The Nephilim were killed after the flood. And then they say there's no, there's no proof of the Nephilim in the New Testament. Although it does say it in your Bible in Genesis chapter 6 when it talks about and there were giants in the land in those days. By the way, those giants are the fallen sons of God. And I don't have time to go into that, but if you're thinking of the Dead Sea Scrolls, it'll prove to you that those fallen sons of God are, are the fallen angels. All right? Don't have time for that one today because there's just too much. I can't just go cross-reference everything. We'd be here till midnight tonight. But if you go to uh, Numbers chapter 13, the very last verse, verse 33, and there we saw, this is Nephilim, your Bible, if you have regular any other translation, it'll say giants, the sons of Anak, who come from, they just say Nephilim again, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. Now in the Hebrew, the sons of Enoch are Nephilim. He, Nun, Fe, Yod, Lamed, Yod, Mem. But when Moses wrote this about Enoch himself, or Enoch, A-N-A-K, that's not Enoch, but A-N-A-K, he is the son of Nephilim. They, this is why I don't like the Talmudic vowels being placed in there. The letters tells it all. He, Nun, Fe, Lamed, Yod, Mem. There is no Yod, okay? So those of you that are looking on here, uh, on the screen, you have the Yod, I highlighted it, that's Nephilim. That distinguishes the fact that the children are the children of the fallen angels, but, uh, but Anak, right here, Ayin Nun Kof, he is from Nephilim. 
and there we don't see any extra yod between this fe or between this lamed here. There's no yod as you saw right here, which shows you that he is a direct descendant of the fallen angels. And it also tells us that he is as well, that they're, that they're not sterile. They can reproduce. All right, so we get rid of all of that. Now, going back to where we left off at. So they are, again, now Isaiah is confirming that they are from that lineage. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land also is full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. All right, so it's not that they're not wealthy and everything. They got everything that they possibly could ever imagine. Now, as I said to you, another thing I wanted to bring up is the fact that in the Septuagint, in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 6, it says, For he has, for, he has forsaken his people, the house of Israel, because their land is filled as at the beginning with divinations, as the land of the Philistines, and many strange children were born to them. Another obvious uh, conjecture by the prophet Isaiah and the Septuagint pointing to the fact that these kids are not normal kids. All right? So, Jesus was coming to put all this in order, and of course, he said about the Pharisees. Because remember, the scripture said that the darkness couldn't receive it. Right? But when Jesus Christ came, he called those Pharisees serpents, a generation of vipers, right? Yeah, we can look at that real quick. We jump back over here to the New Testament, and I'll just quickly take you to Matthew. Uh, chapter 23, again, because there's so many people that, that are not aware of these things. And it's quite a ways down in Matthew there. Uh, I think around verse, uh, let's see, verse 33, yep. You, gener you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? And who's he talking to? The Pharisees. Okay. Uh, yeah, I already had a lot of that already highlighted there, right? So, and he says it multiple times, not just once. And in the Hebrew Matthew, he calls them seed of vipers, reptilians, strange children, as Isaiah has pointed out now. All right, now, let's take a look at the book of Hebrews as well. Now, let me I also add, let's see, I had Zechariah 7. Okay, we already got into that. Jeremiah. All right, this is Jeremiah chapter 31. Now, because I, I was telling you, and I wanted to kind of just remind you, to show you how we know these scriptures are fulfilled. And I didn't put everything up on the screen for sake of time here, but uh, in, I, in, in Hebrews chapter uh, 7, for example, if we go, and maybe I need to put this up regardless though. All right, so let's, let's quickly go there. Uh, I don't want somebody to say, oh, he didn't, why didn't he show us that one? Oh, goodness, so let's... Let's deal with it all. Hebrews, all right, chapter 7. Because see, in the book of Hebrews, uh, the writer of Hebrews, and they, they attribute it to Paul, but there's debate over that, so I don't know. It doesn't matter to me, but still, uh, this book here clearly deals with the Melchizedek priesthood, showing us that a new covenant had to be established. Takes you into all the prophecies for that, right? Uh, but like, let's say if we go down to verse... Uh, just to prove this point here, verse 17, right? For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All right? Who is made not after the law of carnal commandment, but after the power of endless life, right? Uh, for, for he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness of unprofitableness of the uh, for the law made nothing perfect, but bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. Okay? And insomuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For that, though these, those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All right? Now, I want to say too, when we look at this, and I showed you that in the, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they interpreted over in a different part of Isaiah that the mountains were the prophets, right? And he would be the head of the mountains. And I wonder if the hills didn't represent the priest, 
but I don't know. I haven't been able to find anything as of yet, not to say it's not there, that it may, there may be, that may prove that. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, and, and they truly were made, uh, were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Okay? And Christ, he liveth forever, so he continueth forever. But let's moving down into chapter 8, though, of uh, also of uh, the book of Hebrews, uh, especially you get down to verse around verse 7. This is where they begin to quote, For the, that first covenant had been faultless, then should not no place have been sought for the second. Now he's going to start showing you all these scriptures that were fulfilled. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, and saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be uh, to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall teach, uh, shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. No wonder why Jesus said when the little children were trying to come to him and his apostles tried to stop him and said, don't bother the master. He said, suffer little children to come to me. So you can go on and on and on. See, uh, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. The book of Hebrews is showing you that's already been fulfilled. Right? And I believe even in Isaiah... If we go back to Isaiah, let's pull this up here real quick. All right. Um, actually, we're going to have to jump off of that. Let me see if it's over here. All right, we're still in Isaiah here. That's the one where Paul Paul was. Yeah, that's right. They were quoting that. We did already. We'd already covered that. All right. But in Isaiah 2, as soon as it pops over there, there we go. He will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, Paul, when you taught this, you're standing with the Orthodox of Israel of building the third temple, and that they will bring forth the law, when according to all the scripture of New Testament, and even the Old Testament prophesied, that that law would have to be done away with. And it was done away with through the death of Jesus Christ, because he brought the new covenant. And you're trying to take people back to a dead law. How can you do it? Right? And in the book of Hebrews, for example, and in many other places in the Bible as well. And their iniquities will I remember no more. And he will watch what it says here. And he will judge between the nations and shall decide for many peoples. See? They beat their plowshares, uh, share, uh, excuse me, beat their swords into plowshares and their spears and his printing hooks. Nations shall live not lift up against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. And the only light was Jesus Christ. How could that have ever been fulfilled in modern days? It's not possible, Paul. See, it's not possible. It had to have been fulfilled 2,000 years ago. And then he goes on to tell you, For thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob. For they replenish from the east and with soothsayers like the Philistines and they please themselves in the brood of aliens. And we already got Daniel fulfilled and everything else. All these scriptures being fulfilled. And yet, you're looking for something new. I, I just don't get it. Jeremiah is one that he quoted right out of there. Right? Let me just share with you in the book of Hebrews there, how many different scriptures that were being fulfilled that I just quoted to you there, right? When we're reading out of the book of Hebrews, 
He's got Exodus 3.8. In Exodus 19.5, Jeremiah 31.31, Jeremiah 31.33, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 8, Isaiah 54.13, and Jeremiah 31.34. All those scriptures were being fulfilled. And it's no different with Isaiah chapter 2. So friends, I just say to you in closing that the prophecies... Many of them. Not all of them. I, I, granted, I do realize there's more prophecies coming. Judgment's coming, for one. When Christ does return with ten thousands of His saints, it's to bring judgment on the world. It's to destroy this earth with fire and brimstone. And yet we hear all these things. Paul, you've got your sources that speak about uh, fire going to rain down out of the skies. I got mine in Pentagon and D.C., the White House and other places, knowing the same. And we see all the acts that are being done by those in power in Israel that are obviously not for the good of the people. They're not for good for the, even the people in Israel. And they certainly are still oppressing the strangers among them. You know, Yehuda Glick, if you happen to listen to this message, my, my, my friend, let me say to you, Genesis, excuse me, Isaiah, I'll pull it up, so we look at it again. That scripture was fulfilled 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ is the one that fulfilled this. Let me, let me pull it up where we actually can see it. Um, and, and I realize that uh, we don't need the divisions in the body. Now, I, I know, Paul, you did a message on that about me not too long ago, uh, and you took it down, but you were talking about we don't need divisions, and you're right, we don't. But the thing is, is we need to come to the truth of the gospel. You're not going to help my people by sugarcoating everything to them and not telling them the truth. You know, even, even Yehuda, he could have spoke to you in love and said, but what about the oppressed? What about the oppressed? Because the, who are the ones that are oppressed in Israel? If you're going to try to put it in the future, who's the one oppressed in Israel? It's a stranger. It's the Palestinians. Like the Samaritans were the oppressed 2,000 years ago. See, there were no press then. There were the fatherless. There were the widows that were then, were then as well. All right? But that mountain, when we get down here in verse 3, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and He will teach us of His ways. And knowing 2,000 years ago, the rabbis that were down in the Qumran community, which many of those believed that they were the Zadokite priesthood, actually believed that those that, that, that word, and notice, that the mountain, singular, okay, of the Lord's house should be established as the head of the mountains. The Rosh. Right? The Rosh of Haharim. The Zedekite community believed that that represented the prophets. He would be the head. And he'd be exalted above the hills. Maybe it's the priest and maybe the hills are the prophets. I don't know. But clearly, when it comes to Jesus Christ, he was the head. And we also know the scripture calls him the headstone. That the corner that the builders rejected became the head. And that is called a stone, and the stone also is represented as the mountain. And we know according to the prophecy of Daniel, that stone that was cut out without hands will smite the image of Daniel in the feet and will destroy it. And by the way, just in closing, to share with you what that image actually is, when, that, when it speaks about the miry clay and the iron, the clay represents mankind, and that iron represents the AI technology. And Yehuda, 
I say to you, my friend, you know this because you're an Orthodox Jew, a Talmudic believer, that many of the Orthodox community, not all of the Orthodox community, believe in the coming of what is called in the Talmudic community the Holy Serpent. It's taught by the Gona Vilna. The Holy Serpent. There is no Holy Serpent. So I would encourage you, Yehuda, with all my heart, to really go to your knees and ask the Heavenly Father if indeed Jesus Christ truly is the Messiah. I would say to you, you want to help the people of Israel first seek and find from God Himself to know if Jesus Christ truly is the Messiah. If you go with a sincere heart before the Lord, He will respond to you. I do believe that. And Paul, I ask you, my brother, to sincerely repent. I had to repent as well from the Zionist views. And I even today, I say to the people that are listening, forgive me for the errors that I've taught. I don't take them all down for the simple reason is, there's several reasons, but one reason is, people that may pick up on one of the videos of old that is a Zionist teaching will find what I teach now. And I trust that will help them. But I ask you to forgive me for the mistakes that I made. Many of you knew that I was making the mistakes and tried to reach out to me. And I can't answer all emails and things like that. But you stayed there anyway. And I thank you for your kindness in doing that. And I know some people try to say, well, you're, I forget what they call that word, preterist, pret pretist, or some, some, some kind of thing. I, I didn't even know what it was. I have no idea. No. I, I'm not of any organization, no doctrinal persuasion. That was the grace of God that opened our eyes. And He began to open my eyes of my wife first, and then I began to study these things. She asked me to go back and look at it in the Hebrew language, and I began to see the same as well. So Paul, I tell you, my friend, it's not too late. I go into the things there that will be, that will make this video make more sense as well. So at any rate, uh, I'm Steve Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Uh, we thank you. Thank you for those of you that support the broadcast. We appreciate that. Our website is IsraeliNewsLive.org. Uh, you can visit our website there. Uh, I do want to say in closing as well, and I'm not into promoting things, but I just want to tell you, I have spoke about the EMP Shield before on this channel. Uh, I have been getting more confirmation from people and uh, that the things that we're going to be facing in the very near future, that on your vehicle, I think is very important. I wouldn't worry about trying to do all your vehicles or anything like that. Maybe just one for one of your vehicles only. Because if you don't own an old vehicle, um, and it may not necessarily be an EMP attack that they do, which I don't doubt that they wouldn't do that as well. But some of the things that I hear that are the, 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 the government is anticipating to happen, uh, an EMP shield could greatly protect what you do have. And I would say, though, if you do have solar panels or things like that, uh, if you're kind of off-grid, you definitely might want to consider that as well. And I, 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 I'm trying to find a way to get off grid. And we're really kind of stuck in a, in, a, in a very bad situation right now. So pray for us that God will provide a way for us to find some way of safety because we're, we're still not where we need to be at. And so we're praying to asking God to reveal to us where we need to be, uh, things like that, so that we can also... Um, get into a safe place as well. So at any at any rate, at any rate, thank you and thank you for for listening. Uh, by the way, if you do go to their their website, uh, EMPShield.com, if you type in INL for Israeli News Live INL50, they do give you a discount in purchasing that. So and if you're going to purchase several devices, just each time use that code 
as you order and I think every time you get the discount on what you order. So I don't know if you have to order that separately to do that or not. I have no idea. I apologize. I just don't know. I'm, I'm just not into those things. But anyway, God bless you and thank you. Good day.